Let's talk about colonizing a planet, packing up and leaving the Earth for a new home on the surface of an alien world, extending the light of consciousness to the stars in the words of Elon Musk. Exploring new worlds is the backbone of our favorite science fiction fantasies. Flying around in space is cool and all, but at some point our heroes have to step off onto a new planet with new adventures. And for humanity, that first step towards a multi-planetary existence will undoubtedly have to be Mars. We've had our eye on the red planet for decades, and it's finally looking like now is our time to take that next giant leap and establish a human presence on the planet Mars. But uh, it's not going to be easy, obviously. In fact, the difficulties posed by a Martian settlement are staggering. The level of danger is terrifying, but the human innovations that are rising to meet these challenges are equally as stunning. And if we can manage to work together towards that one common goal, then extending humanity to a multi-planetary existence really starts to feel like something that we can accomplish in this generation. This is the space race. Okay, so the first inconvenient truth that you run into when looking closely at the whole Martian situation is just how exceptionally deadly the planet Mars is to human beings. Like there is nothing hospitable about this environment whatsoever. And that's going to be the first big problem that we need to solve. Probably the biggest obstacle on Mars is going to be its very thin atmosphere. The atmospheric pressure on Mars is less than 1% of what we have here on Earth. That means that human beings would not be able to survive outside of a pressurized environment. Even if we could breathe on Mars, the low pressure would cause your circulatory system to fail in less than a minute. And this also means that liquid water is physically impossible on Mars. At an average temperature of negative 60 degrees Celsius, obviously water on the surface would be frozen solid. But even if you were to heat up the ice on Mars to the point of melting, it would never become liquid due to the low pressure environment. Water will transfer straight from solid ice to gas or vapor. Then there's dust. Mars is known for its humongous dust storms that can span for miles on end. About once every decade, there is a dust storm that consumes the entire planet. We don't even know exactly why that happens, but it's a serious problem for any technology that happens to be on the surface. In 2018, NASA's Opportunity rover was killed off by a dust storm that coated it to the point that the solar panels failed. Martian dust is electrostatic, so it has a unique tendency to just cling to any surface. If you think sand gets everywhere, just wait until you see Martian dust. And if that wasn't enough, the dust is toxic. Exposure to Mars dust is likely to cause serious lung diseases in humans. So anything at all that enters our habitat needs to be completely dust free. And just in case that wasn't enough, we have cosmic radiation on top of it all. Because Mars has very little atmosphere, it also has very little protection from the unfathomably gigantic nuclear reactor that is our sun. We still don't know exactly what that means for human life on the planet. We do have ideas about shielding Martian colonists from cosmic radiation, but it's unlikely that we can block out 100% of the waves, and we don't really have any data for what kind of effect that will have on people. The most we have to go on is the Apollo astronauts who spent a few days outside of Earth's magnetic field. They seem to have been fine. Most of those guys live to a ripe old age with few complications. Buzz Aldrin is still punching flat earthers in the face at 90 years old. But what happens after weeks, months, or years of exposure? We don't know. And the first colonists to Mars are going to be our guinea pigs for this whole experiment. People going to Mars will pretty much just have to accept that exposure to cosmic radiation is part of the job. And that could turn them into the Fantastic Four, or it could give them space cancer. While talking about sending people to Mars, Elon Musk famously said, people will probably die. And he's probably right on that one. The pioneer phase of Mars settlement will be harsh to say the least, but can it ever get any easier? All of the evidence that we have points to the fact that Mars wasn't always a frozen desert planet. We are pretty sure that liquid water was present on the surface at some point in its 4.6 billion year history. There's even still hope that we might find some kind of fossilized remains of life on Mars, and that means that there was an atmosphere at one point in time. So what happened to it? 
and can we get it back? Can we terraform the planet Mars into an Earth-like environment? So the theory is that if a planet's atmosphere disappeared, it could have gone one of two directions. Either the atmospheric elements like carbon dioxide are absorbed into the surface of the planet, or those elements are dissipated out into space. Unfortunately for us, it seems like the situation on Mars is the latter. It's likely that solar winds blew away the atmosphere from Mars. And the reason that this likely happened is because of magnetic fields. We know that the interior of the Earth is very lively. We live on tectonic plates that float on top of a layer of molten rock that surrounds a hot, rotating core of the Earth. The interior generates a powerful magnetic field that extends from the center of the Earth out into the space that surrounds us, and that creates a protective shield against all of the dangerous stuff coming at us from the Sun on a daily basis. Mars doesn't have that. There are no plate tectonics or rotating magnetic core on the planet. As far as we can tell, it's just a big chunk of rock, so no protective shield. At least not right now. It may have been different in the past, but at some point that activity stopped. And over the course of billions of years, the Martian atmosphere just escaped off into space. So all of that to say that putting the atmosphere back over Mars is not going to be easy or even possible, but that hasn't stopped people from coming up with some crazy ideas. Take Elon Musk, for example. He thinks we should nuke Mars. It sounds crazy, but he's got the right idea. We know that there is carbon dioxide and hydrogen and oxygen on the surface of Mars. The polar regions of the planet contain a lot of ice in particular. So the nuke Mars theory suggests that if we were to detonate a whole bunch of nuclear bombs in space above the poles, we could essentially create the effect of a miniature sun over Mars that should generate enough heat to melt the surface and release all of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And in effect, we could create global warming on Mars. But it probably won't work. At least it won't work anywhere near good enough to justify nuking a planet, because we know that the majority of greenhouse gases that did exist on Mars went up into space, not down into the surface. So even if we did release all of the stored up gas in those polar regions, it wouldn't pressurize the planet. Most scientists agree that the best we could hope for is getting the atmosphere pressure up to about 7% of what we have here on Earth. And unfortunately, that's about all we got right now. If we're going to go, we're just going to have to deal with the fact that the planet Mars is actively trying to kill us at all times. Terraforming Mars might happen someday, but it's going to require us to invent something that does not exist right now, and that's probably a topic for a whole other video. Okay, so if we can't make Mars more like Earth, then we'll just have to bring Earth-like conditions to Mars. And fortunately, NASA has already made a start on that problem with a new experiment that is being done by the Perseverance rover. The Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment, or MOXIE for short, has succeeded in transforming a small amount of carbon dioxide rich atmosphere on Mars into oxygen. The current MOXIE unit is about the size of a toaster and uses extreme heat of around 800 degrees Celsius to separate oxygen atoms from carbon dioxide molecules. If this technology is scalable to something that can provide for a settlement, then we've at least got a chance at this. Elon Musk thinks we should live in cities under glass domes, which would be really cool and futuristic, obviously, and it's reasonable to think that we could create a microclimate within the dome with a pressurized atmosphere. But then we have to figure out a way to transport dome materials to Mars, or set up a dome manufacturing facility on Mars. Even if we could build it, the dome would just get covered in dust and we'd end up in basically a big dust igloo. Not to mention the very low chance that the dome material could properly shield us from that cosmic radiation that we really need to be avoiding as much as possible. NASA has this idea for 3D printed dirt eggs, or at least that's the best idea they have found so far. The idea for the egg comes from American architecture firm AI Space Factory. They won NASA's 3D printed habitat challenge with their idea to use Martian rocks as a building material for their egg shaped habitat. Basalt could be mined from the surface, then crushed and mixed with a plant based bioplastic to create a super strong and 3D printable material. The concentric circles of rock and plant mixture would be laid down by a fully automated robot 
and AI Space Factory are confident that their material will harden into a structure that is resistant to both cosmic radiation and extreme temperature. They chose the egg shape for its structural efficiency. The egg is one of nature's greatest designs, an incredibly thin shell with just the right amount of strength. It's a really cool idea, but it's not without flaws. There still needs to be a pretty sophisticated airlock system worked into any kind of design for a building on Mars, so the idea of everyone having their own personal home is a bit extra. You can't just walk through the front door and pop your helmet off. Not only because of the massive differences in air pressure, but also you have to remember that you will be coated in toxic dust and you can't be tracking that into the house. Realistically, the best bet for people on Mars is to just live underground. I know it's not the most exciting solution and it kind of seems pointless to be on another planet if you're just inside a windowless room all day, but if we wanna be practical, then the safest place we can be is under the ground. Work on the surface is going to be best left to autonomous robots like the ones that we have seen from Boston Dynamics, or this could be a perfect application for the upcoming Tesla bot that we've just recently been teased with. As a society, we've gotten pretty good at building underground tunnels and transport systems and bunkers and all of that. So it's not a stretch to imagine we could just carry that over to a facility on Mars. Regardless of what model we choose, there is still the human factor that needs to be overcome. That is, we are talking about people living in very close quarters with each other for periods of months and years, surrounded by hostile conditions with no way out. Sounds like a great environment for people to go insane, right? NASA is working on that one too, though. They are currently in the recruiting phase for a year-long study into the effects of a simulated Mars mission. The experiment will involve four people living and working on a 1700 square foot model of a Martian base. The 3D printed module will simulate the challenges of a mission on Mars, including resource limitations, equipment failures, communication delays, and other environmental stressors. And they aren't looking for average Joes in this one. A master's degree in a STEM field is the basic requirement to get in on the experiment. Then NASA is going to monitor the physical and psychological effects on the participants over the course of a year. So basically we get to see if four geniuses can work together for the betterment of mankind or if they just start trying to kill each other. The experiment is scheduled to begin in 2022 and I really hope we get a live stream. This is like big brother but way better. Now, before we can even start building anything on Mars, we are going to need some sort of electricity, and that's a tricky one. Solar has been our best bet so far for powering the series of Mars rovers that we've been experimenting with, but it's probably not the ideal power source. Like we said earlier, a big enough dust storm can make solar panels useless, and the electrostatic nature of the dust means that once they are covered, they are likely to stay that way until something intentionally cleans them off. And even without the dust, we're still going to have problems with solar energy just for the fact that Mars is further away from the sun than Earth, and that means that the energy available for capture is going to be less. That doesn't make solar impossible, but it does make it more difficult. Luckily, we've got Elon Musk on Team Mars and his electric vehicle company, Tesla, happen to also be world leaders in solar power generation and large battery storage. So it's plausible that Elon can pull through with the tech that we need to make this happen. Solar panels need battery storage to regulate the energy they collect, so that needs to be factored in. The Tesla Megapack is big and heavy at around 50,000 pounds and 7 meters long, but in theory you could fit a couple of them into one SpaceX Starship flight to Mars. A much less complicated solution to the electricity problem could probably be nuclear power on Mars. It does sound a bit crazy, especially if all you've ever known is the kind of giant nuclear plant that Homer Simpson works in, but like we discussed in our video on nuclear power in rocket engines, the technology can actually be downsized and controlled pretty easily. Yet again, NASA have already started working on this problem, and their answer is Project Kilopower. This is a relatively small and portable nuclear fission reactor that can output as much as 10 kilowatts of power. It's not a ton of electricity, even at maximum, it's probably about enough to run a couple of household appliances, but each kilopower reactor is pretty small. The actual reactor core is about one meter long. The whole unit is only about the size of a tall person, and they can be linked together for more output. NASA is assuming that it would only take four of these generators to power one small outpost, and they can be scaled up from there. 
They conducted the first successful test of this system on Earth in 2018 and are ready to take it into space for the next step. NASA plans to use this system to power operations on the moon within the next few years, with the goal of moving the experiment to Mars following that. Okay, so if that's the plan for life on Mars, then when can we get started? Again, it's a tricky one. The biggest thing we have sent to the planet so far is the new Perseverance rover. It's about the size of a car. We need to send a lot more stuff first before we can ever consider sending people. Because of the limited window for transit between Earth and Mars, this is not going to be a short stay. People will be there for at least two years at a time, and that means they will need something established when they arrive. Food, water, shelter. That all needs to be figured out well before humans start landing on the planet. Elon Musk is pretty confident that he can start landing his Starship vehicles on Mars by 2026, which is a really good first step. Each ship is supposed to be capable of 100 metric tons of cargo capacity. So in theory, we only need a few ships full of supplies to have something that people can work with. But then that brings up even more logistical questions, like how do we unload the Starship once they get to Mars? Can a handful of astronauts reasonably deal with hundreds of tons of stuff packed away in half a dozen spaceships? Probably not. I think that brings us back to robots. Robots have to be the key to actually making any of this work. And I think that's exactly why Tesla started working on their own labor robot. We shouldn't be surprised at all if we start seeing Tesla bots going along with these supply runs to Mars. Maybe not for the first landings in 2026, but we can probably say for sure that Mars missions in 2028 will be spearheaded by autonomous humanoid robots. And that sets the stage for humans to arrive in 2030 to a pre-established Martian colony. And I don't know where we go from there, but I could not be more excited to find out. So let us know what you guys think. Is human life on Mars possible? Do you think that terraforming the planet is still going to be a possibility? Drop your theories in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching the video today. We're still pretty new at this, so we really appreciate all of your support. Dropping a like on the video really helps our channel to grow and find new people. And leaving a comment is even better. So we really want to hear what you guys think of the latest space race news. So don't be shy. If you want to learn more about the space race, we've got two more videos up there on the screen for you. Please subscribe to our channel for weekly updates, and we'll see you in the next one.